All right, so in this video, I'm gonna be exploring marginal gains. All right, so in this video, I'm gonna explore marginal gains. What is it? Why is it that a lot of people misuse and get the term wrong when they're actually trying to think differently about performance? And what are the simple frameworks that might be to help you get started with this area? So marginal gains, or to give its full term, the aggregation of marginal gains. This is a term that came specifically from British cycling. So it was, it was formed in the velodrome up in Manchester, and it probably arose around about the early 2000s. And, and certainly Sir David Brailsford has been most famously associated with this particular term. And his initial work with uh, a luminary in the area, Peter Keane, they started to form this philosophy of, look, if it's not really relevant for performance, we're not going to be considering it. Now, marginal gains has become known for a different concept, and that is this sort of one percenters, these small, tiny little changes that we're gonna hopefully get together and they're going to add up and that can make all of the difference. So a quick story for you, and I don't know whether this is true. I've tried to source to see if it is with, with various people who have might, have might have been involved in the time. And so this was um, in the lead up to the Beijing Olympics and so British cycling were about to have their big breakthrough moment. And they were looking at different types of lubricants to use around the bearings of a wheel. And one of the engineers was working in the, the labs up at the, the velodrome, and they had stumbled across a particular type of lubricant, and it was extremely expensive, extremely rare, but they'd spent a lot of time trying to find it, source it, and then started to use it. So the story goes that they had used this lubricant on the bearings of the hub for the first time, and they, they they put a wheel on a stand so it was freewheeling and they got the wheel and they span it. They span it really hard and it just kept spinning and they just stood there and watched it for a couple of minutes. And that's typical to see a, a, a wheel spin for so long. And so what happened was that they came back the next day and it was still spinning. So low was the friction that the lubricant gave that the wheel just kept going. And I tell you this story for a couple of reasons. And, and lubricant around a hub is, is really important so that make sure that the machinery is, is running smoothly. But in relative terms, the aerodynamic drag, the force characteristics that an athlete is able to push on the pedal, those two concepts about pushing hard the pedal to propel the bike and then overcoming the drag resistance. Those are the two most important things that a cyclist is going to have to work with. And so whilst lubricant around a hub of a wheel is really important, if in finding that, sourcing it, trialing it, testing it, you have expended an awful lot of energy trying to work that bit out, but you've neglected aerodynamic drag, you've neglected the, the force on the pedals, then it's likely that you've deployed your resources in the wrong space. So on the plus side for marginal gains, it has real exploration around it. It encourages you to go and explore, go and find out. It has this idea of wonder, of trying to find things that could be of use. It often means that teams are really open to different possibilities, rather than just thinking, well, that's the way that we do it. There's a sense of, well, if we think it can add value, then it's going to go on the sheet. And there's a level of aspiration. So this is all about, look, we are performance focused. We want to achieve. And so we're willing to go where other people might not be. It also has to make sense. So in order for us to be doing this, we need to be sure that the idea that we're considering actually makes sense. There is some fundamental principles or fundamental thinking that this probably is going to help us. We've also got to make sure that there is a, is going to add value. This, this idea that, okay, well, we can get distracted by all sorts of different things, but we think this is going to nudge us in the, in the right direction. Is it on the positive side of the line rather than just a 
uh, a negative or actually there's low evidence that it's, it, can, it can help us. It also has to be implementable. So quite simply, you have to be able to go and deliver upon this. Notice there isn't cost on here necessarily. And I'll give you an example here. This is where I went to speak overseas at an international federation and I was talking to them about the, the philosophies of performance they might be able to utilise. And one of their questions, particularly about, about the success of British Cycling, was where can we buy the aerodynamic suits from? And I specifically, I was tempted to say Halfords, but uh, I didn't. I, I said, I, you have to go and do the research. You have to go and create those materials yourself. You have to go and do the research in the aero tunnels. And they just went, oh, as if, you know what? I thought it was just a simple solution. I thought you just found the manufacturer and the product supplier, that we could just copy that. And so sometimes when there's a, it's a lot of hassle associated, a high cost line, then being able to devote resources to that and devote efforts to that particular area means that you have a competitive advantage, primarily because other people just can't be bothered or they're just not invested in being able to commit to doing a project of that complexity. So typically things like cost, how measurable, uh, the complexity, those aren't necessarily deciding factors and in fact actually sometimes when complexity or cost or difficulty might be high that might mean actually there's, there's a, a rich source of competitive advantage simply because nobody's done it before, because of those reasons. Now here's where people go wrong with marginal gains. There's a mistake that a lot of people will, will fall into the trap of, of making when they see something and they think, oh, okay, there's a marginal gain. That's something we should be doing. Oh, we should be doing that. And I'll give you this as a, a specific example. So what I'll do now is I'll sketch out uh, almost a, like a brainstorm of different topics that could enhance middle distance running performance. So let's just say 800 meter running performance and I'm going to just brainstorm different ideas that could help. All right, so 800 meter performance. So I'll just go through this brain dump. So mileage, pacing, hormonal responses, menstrual cycling, cycle monitoring for women, carbohydrate intake for training and performance, fast start, sprint mechanics, uh, warm up methods for training, bicarbonate and citrate supplementation, VVO2 max reps, uh, drafting in race, VO2 max reps, so, so that's repeated twice because that's so important. Maximum lactate steady state, breathing training, hemoglobin mass development, altitude, core development, caffeine supplementation, creatine supplementation, hydration, uh, drills and skills, downhill running, beta alanine, uh, ankle foot stability, carnitine for fat oxidation, even pace methods, uh, strength and conditioning for glute and hamstring strength, compression garments, high intensity warm up. I think I've got warm up in there twice as well. Hill reps uh, and pacing. I think I've covered that one. So this is a brain dump of potential ideas. If you were an 800 meter runner, then these are the sorts of things that you could be considering. So you could look at that and you think, fantastic, that's so many things that we could benefit from in terms of our performance. And, and you could, if you were to be able to exploit all the different areas there, then I've no doubt that they would add up, they would aggregate in terms of their gains. But now can you see the potential problem? I worked with one team manager once who used to say, okay, right, everybody, we need to focus on athlete A. Athlete A is the top priority. They're where the medals lie. We need to focus our resources on them, everything towards them. Ah, yeah, and athlete B, then they've got great potential too. And athlete C's got great potential. And we mustn't forget about D, E, and F, and G, H, and I, and J, K, and L, and M. And then suddenly we've gone from really prioritized through to Actually, we're now trying to spread ourselves too thinly because if we try and do all of these things, it's likely that actually what's going to happen is that we're going to do a lot of them really, really badly. 
And so what you end up trying to do is become expert project managers where you're spinning plates, too many plates, and inevitably a few of those are going to wobble, a few of those are going to drop, rather than spinning a couple of plates really well. And so what this really lacks is a sense of priority. It's so important to make sure that you're focusing on the things that can really add value to your program. So when it comes to using the idea behind marginal gains, then you have to know that it's probably going to work. And that often means that you have to do some statistical analysis. You have to know whether the, the concept that you're working with is something that actually relates to performance. It's a determinant performance. That's something that we'll probably cover off in another video another time. You also have to know that they're adaptable. So a lot of deterministic models have got elements in there, such as body height or limb length, as a determining factor of performance. But those aren't things that are necessarily adaptable. It's really important when you start doing this sort of brain dump is that you start to look for things that are a super high priority for you. What are the things that may be holding you back, so it's a bit of a weakness, or actually what are the things that are a real strength for you and probably are most adaptable for you? And whether you've got a sense of what the big priorities are, that you're going to really deploy your resources and do that really well. And the final determining factor are those things which you can make a small change that can give you a big difference. And if you can spend time in the planning process, the, the, the modeling process, and the thought process is very simply at the start, honing in on what are the things that are going to give us the biggest gain for the smallest amount of effort and resource and cost. Because ultimately, when it comes to being able to deploy your efforts towards a performance effort, you've got to be really clear about the things that are going to offer you the biggest improvements in performance. And really, you shouldn't necessarily be chasing the tiny little things if you haven't got the big things sorted first. So if you want to use the idea behind marginal gains, can I suggest to you that you start with the big priorities first? It's all too easy for us to jump to some of that shiny, superficial stuff when actually we haven't covered the basics really well. Do the basics fundamentally well and you're going to be experiencing massive gains as opposed to marginal gains. When you start to get into some of the smaller things, go for the bigger priorities to start off with. What's going to add most value and for the smallest amount of effort? And that you have some confidence that's going to relate to an improvement in performance because we know it's something that can adapt and can respond to intervention. Hope that's been helpful for you in terms of your thinking about how you're developing performance. Don't jump to the shiny little, little things to start off with. Get the basics done brilliantly first. Cheers for watching.